Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Lear McCorrick, and I'm art director at Veritas. Uh, I'm also the lead designer on the Credo High School series. So uh, what is, exactly does that mean? This is what a spread from the Credo High School book looks like before it comes to me. And this is what it looks like when I'm finished with it. So very nice, very pretty. We put a few pictures in there, but so what? What does that mean for you as religious educators? Uh, I'm going to start with an example. What you're looking at is a description of Napoleon crossing the Alps in the year 1800. Here's another description. This description is accurate, it's well-researched, and it's beautifully written. This description is immediate. It draws in the viewer, gets them interested, and hopefully they will go on to read this description. This description is currently being tweeted and liked on Facebook and pinned to Pinterest by our student. Uh, our student is a typical digital native. Uh, she's one of the 81% of teenagers who engages regularly with social media. Uh, she lives in a household where her parents spend 11 hours a day on average engaging with digital media of various types. She's used to absorbing rich content like this and this together. So in order to reach her, we've tried to harness the power of the written word and the visual image to create something that really speaks to her in language that she understands. I'd like to say that Veritas invented this idea, but uh, unfortunately we can't uh, lay claim to that. Um, catechists have been using images to reinforce their message for centuries. Uh, in Ireland we're all familiar with the idea of the Celtic High Cross. Um, these are crosses with carved images on them. Uh, while we tend to see them today as standalone art pieces, they would have been used originally as teaching tools. So a priest and a group of uh, parishioners would have stood around one of these crosses, and the priest would have told a story from scripture, and these images behind him would have served as uh, visual cues. So uh, on the left there we see um, the fall of man, and on the right you see the murder of Abel by Cain. A similar idea is used by this piece, um, which you can see down the road in the Getty Museum. Um, this is an altarpiece from a church, uh, probably de dedicated to St. Catherine of Alexandria. You can see it uh, illustrates a number of scenes from the saint's life. Um, this would have been used by the priest uh, to explain stories from the, the life of the saint. You can see it's laid out sort of like a conic strip of various different episodes of the saint's life. The simplest way that art can aid the religious educator is by the simple exposition of a scene. Um, this is an illustration of a scene from the second chapter of Mark's account of the Gospel, where Jesus heals the paralytic man. I'm reading this passage, I was always somewhat confused by what was happening in the scene. You remember that uh, the paralytic man's friends wanted to get him to Jesus, but there was such a large crowd of people around him that they couldn't get anywhere near. Um, Mark describes them digging a hole and dropping their friend in on a mat. But what exactly does that look like? And you can see the artist here has um, illustrated this very, very clearly. Um, the paralytic man's friends are on the roof of the building where Jesus is, and they've lowered him in on these cables. You can see it was probably a pretty long drop. He doesn't look all that comfortable. Um, but he's captured the scene at the moment where Jesus tells him to take up his bed and walk. You can see the Pharisees there on the left who look uh, not too impressed. This is just a very, very basic way of how art can explain a scene. Um, this illustration comes from an illustrated Bible, so it would have been used precisely for that end. Another function that art can serve in the classroom is to get students talking about a more complex idea. Uh, to illustrate this, I've chosen some images of the Holy Trinity. Art doesn't exactly lend itself to putting in concrete terms something which is by its very essence, undefinable. And we can see a couple of different artists' approaches to trying to define the undefinable, so to speak. You can see in this first example, um, we see the three divine persons who are sharing the same facial features. Uh, they're wearing the same robe, but they have different attributes. You can see um, God the Son with the, the marks of the Passion and uh, the carrying the cross. God the Father has the orb of creation and the crown and the Holy Spirit, uh, the, the dove. Um, also, they all have different hairstyle. 
Um, by contrast, another um, variation on this theme uh, is uh, this painting, which takes a very literal approach to the words of the creed, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. And then there's this, uh, which is a slightly disturbing allegory uh, of the Holy Trinity. Um, three identical faces on one head. A useful tool for the classroom is to have the students compare and contrast two different representations of the same scene by two different artists. Uh, here we can see the conversion of Saul by Peter Bruegel. Um, this is sort of like a Where's Waldo picture. Um, if you can find Saul uh, in this uh, painting, you, you win a prize. Um, I've made it easy for you, there he is. Um, you could ask your students why they think Bruegel chose to represent this momentous event from the New Testament in the middle of this crowd of soldiers and horsemen and why they think that the contemporary painter, Andrei Mironov, has represented it this way, close in on Paul. Uh, he is literally at the moment where he sees the light. When I went through the Getty Museum, I was very, very struck by this painting um, by a follower of Caravaggio's. And this brought home to me the idea that a painting of a scene from the scriptures can be used to start a discussion about something that it doesn't necessarily literally represent. And I thought, this painting is interesting. Um, the way it, it is an illustration of the scene of, of um, the woman taken in adultery. But how does this reflect our own society? The idea that the woman's accusers are all looking down and none of them will meet their eye apart from Jesus himself. A painting like this one um, I feel is a great way to encourage the students to see themselves in these events which happened so long ago and in a culture so very, very different from ours. Um, this is the Annunciation and a very unusual uh, representation. Uh, we can see Mary as a vulnerable teenager, somebody who's probably not that much older than the students who are looking at this. Um, and she's witnessing a truly terrifying spectacle of an apparition of a supernatural creature. But you can see in her eyes, this is the moment where she goes from terror to an understanding of what it is that she's being asked to do. Uh, this painting is by Henry Tanner, uh, who is probably the first well-known African-American painter, uh, which brings us to the next point. This painting, The Head of Christ, is the most widely used and the most widely recognized image of Jesus in America today. Uh, it was painted during the Second World War by a commercial artist called Warner Salman. And Warner Salman has chosen to portray Jesus as a movie star with uh, rugged, chiseled features and blue eyes and a Caucasian complexion that's truly at odds with the idea of someone who grew up in the Middle East. Um, looking at this picture and looking at our church today, I wonder how well it speaks to the teenagers who would be in your classrooms. Uh, with this in mind, when we were coming up with the covers for our Credo High School series, I tried to steer away from this idea of the blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus and um, come up with something that was a little less uh, redolent of Cecil B. DeMille. These are the images that I chose for the covers of the Credo High School series. I thought these images would speak in a different way to today's teenagers. Um, they approach the idea of what Jesus may have looked like from different cultural perspectives. Um, Jesus is imbued with different ethnicities. And who's to say, really, that these Jesuses are any less valid than the chiseled, featured George Clooney Jesus that we see in other representations? One of the privileges of working on the Kratos series has been the chance to use images by artists whose work I really admire. Laura James is an American artist of Antiguan descent, and she paints in the tradition of the uh, early Ethiopian Christian art of the third and fourth centuries. Janet McKenzie's work is very well known through her painting, uh, Jesus of the People, uh, and her work uses models of African-American ethnicity, 
um, Native American ethnicity to create a really new interpretation of uh, the Holy Family for today. Mickey McGrath, who often speaks at Congress, uh, has stated that his aim is to rid religious art of the idea that the Holy Family looked like Ken and Barbie dressed in Bible clothes, which is a point I can sympathize with. Fritz Eichenbach, whose really startling work for the Catholic Worker newspaper, brought to the fore through, through the, such a, a stark media the social agenda that was uh, favored by that particular publication. By contrast, Hei Ki uses uh, bright colors and exciting, vivid imagery to get through the, the message of joy here in the scene of the resurrection. And then there's the stark cinematic vision of Andrei Mironov, a contemporary Russian painter, who uses real life models and very high contrast lighting to get across the reality, but also the drama and the mysticism uh, inherent in the, the scriptures. Christian art has been around almost as long as Christianity itself. This image is almost 2,000 years old. Every day, young Christians are discovering this art for the first time and realizing that they are part of a tradition that stretches back all the way to third century Rome. Robert Barron has said that Catholicism is a beautiful religion. I think that he could have gone further and said that Catholicism is the most beautiful religion. He says that we should lead with the beautiful before we proceed to the good and the true. One of my privileges has been to take images like these from the gallery and return them to the hands of religious educators such as yourselves. Thank you.